Welcome to our program, Your Right to Know, Our Pleasure to Tell. Sitting with me here today is the Minister of National Security and Labor, the Honorable Dr. Errol Court. Today's conversation, you'll be given an in-depth view of the United Progressive Party government and what they have achieved over the past five to ten years. Dr. Court, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today on another session of Your Right to Know, Our Pleasure to Tell. Thank you very much for having me. It's certainly my pleasure to be here. You are welcome, sir. Let's jump into our conversation and talk about an issue that needs a clear-cut answer with regards to unemployment and the rate. How can you expand on that, sir? We have had a challenge in this country in respect of having accurate uh, unemployment data. Mm -hmm. And that is so because we have not embarked upon a uh, labor force survey. Okay. Now, to date, what we've been doing is providing some guesstimates in terms of what the unemployment rate is likely to be. Yes. I wish to share with you three possible approaches in respect of this particular matter. Okay. We know that persons are required to register with the Social Security scheme. And therefore, if you look at the Social Security uh, registrants over the last couple of years, and you try to measure uh, any fall off in the registration yes. and the payment, rather, of Social Security, that could give you a crude estimate in terms of what the unemployment rate would be. Okay. More specifically, if you're working, your employer would be deducting your Social Security and paying it over. If you're not working, then there would not be any payments made to Social Security on your behalf. Mm -hmm. So clearly, you could look at those numbers to get a sense as to persons who would have been employed and who are no longer employed. When we look at those figures, um, the Social Security estimates are showing an unemployment rate of about 12 to 13 percent. Okay. Now, so that's one approach. Another approach, which uh, some of my colleagues have utilized, is to say, well, we have just recently had a re-registration process for elections in this country. Mm -hmm. And there is a column where uh, you are asked to fill in your occupation. And in that column, you do have a number of persons who are recorded as unemployed. Yeah. When you look at that, and I believe maybe, what, 40 odd thousand persons would have been re-registered. And you look at the numbers who claim to be unemployed, that figure is in the vicinity of about 10%. The third I wish to point out is this. We in the Ministry of Labor would have engaged a consultant to do an employer's survey for us. And within that employer's survey, questions would have been asked in respect of vacancies and uh, unemployment rates and so forth. The draft report that was submitted to me recently from an OECS consultant engaged to carry out this exercise for us, shows an unemployment rate of approximately 8%. Mm -hmm. Now, using those three different guesstimates, I would arrive at the position of saying that, in my opinion, as Labor Minister, mm -hmm. I do not believe that the unemployment rate in this country would be in excess of 15%. Okay. So I am taking the higher end of the stick, using a social security um, statistic, and adjusting it for persons, for example, who may be under the radar and who uh, may not necessarily be registered with social security. Mm -hmm. For example, persons who are self-employed. You know, we may not be capturing them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, with some flexibility, I am prepared to give perhaps another two or three points. So that is why I'm saying I do not believe that unemployment is in excess of 15% in this country. Having said that, though, mm -hmm. we are in the process of this year embarking on a labor force survey, mm -hmm. which would give us a clearer idea of what the unemployment rate is. 
We've also been working with the International Labour Organization, ILO, mm -hmm. to set up systems to allow us to be able to calculate unemployment um, on a quarterly basis. We've already accessed, accessed the software, mm -hmm. and we're now in the process of putting things together, and we will, through the statistical department, be conducting the necessary surveys so we'll have more accurate figures. Okay, do you think there's a, what, what do you think the major contributing factor is to the free unemployment rate and is it increasing? Well, clearly, um, the whole world would have gone through a significant recession, yes. unknown um, to, to many countries. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what we would be experiencing here in terms of higher rates of unemployment is not unusual in many, many or most other countries. Okay. Um, so that is what's happening, but I am pleased and I'm satisfied that we have turned the corner. Mm -hmm. And you could see that in terms of our real GDP growth rates. And I would anticipate that our levels of unemployment will begin to fall, especially when a number of those projects begin to come on stream in 2014. Although it may not be of much comfort to persons who are unemployed here in Antigua and Barbuda, when you look at the unemployment rates in some of our neighboring countries, you would see that those rates are pretty high, yeah. as high as 40% wow. in a particular OECS country, and as high as 30% in another OECS country, which our opponents like to say should be the benchmark for Antigua and Barbuda, mm -hmm. and it's the largest economy in the OECS, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we're doing badly, but it is my goal and my desire to remove and eliminate any unemployment in Antigua and Barbuda. There's another serious issue that we're facing in Antigua and Barbuda, and that is crime and lawlessness. As the Minister of National Security, what are some of the strategic steps that you have taken to curb the increase of crime? Yeah, well, again, you know, um, when you look globally, this whole issue of crime and violence yes. is not something that is unique to us alone in Antigua and mm -hmm. Barbuda. When I speak to national security ministers throughout the region, they are lamenting, and in actual fact, we tend to be in a much better position than many of our Caribbean colleagues in respect of this vexing issue. Okay. Uh, I am sure when you look at, for example, Trinidad and Tobago, and you look at the murder rate for the first month mm -hmm. of 2014, mm -hmm. and, and you look at a number of the other countries. Uh, having said that, though, we continue to ensure that we take a very aggressive approach to crime. So we have done a number of things. We have introduced what is called a joint task force on crime. Okay. And that task force is a task force consistent not only of the Royal Police Force of Antigua and Barbuda, but the military. Okay. We have been using our military to buttress the police in terms of patrolling the streets of Antigua and Barbuda and bringing uh, making people feel more safe. Yeah. Um, and that has gone very well. We recently opened a new um, Coast Guard facility out in English Harbor and expanded our joint task force. So we have a physical presence on that part of the island. Okay. So we have added to our uh, joint task force strength. And we are doing many more patrols, all in an effort to ensure that we keep crime and violence at a minimum. Another strategic plan with regards to keeping data for crime and, and, and assaults, how is your, your ministry handling that, as, that aspect? Well, the police would have um, radically improved mm -hmm. the whole data collection and management of data in respect of crime. Yes. We have a, an entire department, Stratum, that deals with reporting of crime mm -hmm. and keeping accurate data in respect of crime. Hence, people in the media could, or, or they know exactly what is transpiring. Yes. In the past, there may have been some thinking, and this is years ago, mm -hmm. that one should not report crime. Don't let the public know. Mm -hmm. But you have a right to know. You have a right to know what is happening. So every day, 
there is a report issued by Stratcom in respect to the criminal activity that would have transpired. Yeah. So the public is kept up to date, and therefore we have very accurate statistics. And therefore, at the end of any year, we could say we had X number of uh, criminal acts reported for the year 2013. And when you compare that to 2012, crime would have increased or decreased, as the case may be. So we have drastically improved upon our whole data collection and um, how we explain the criminal acts taking place in this country. Okay. Uh, Mr. Minister, you have been the Minister of National Security and Labor for the past five years. Um, how would you or what would you list as the significant achievements under your uh, ministry? I think I would start from the standpoint of saying that the Honorable Prime Minister, Dr. Winston Baldwin Spencer, mm -hmm. obviously had a great vision in terms of creating the Ministry of National Security and Labor. Yeah. You know, that's a new ministry. Prior to March of 2009, that ministry did not exist. Okay. The thinking really was to bring all of the law enforcement arms on the one ministry and also to link that critical component of labor, which has that work permit aspect to yeah. the Ministry of National Security. So this ministry covers the police, it covers the military, it covers the prison, it covers the immigration department, it covers passports and citizenships and visas, and it covers on the labor side all matters pertaining to labor, including the granting of work permits. Mm -hmm. And I think that the creation of that ministry and the synergies that would have been formed would have gone a long way in terms of assisting in the better management of government. i give you one example. Mm -hmm. Prior to 2009, uh, you would have had the Immigration Department under one ministry and the Labor Department under a totally different ministry. Mm -hmm. So if and when you need a work permit, you go and you apply for the work permit. When you get the work permit, you then have to go to a totally different office to get the work permit stamped into your passport. Now, the Labor Department with the work permit section is in the same office as the Extension Department for the Immigration. Mm -hmm. So when you go to pick up your work permit, you get your work permit and you just walk over into another room and you could get that work permit stamped into your passport by the immigration department. Mm -hmm. So it's a seamless operation. And that would have therefore facilitated the process and would have made it much more efficient. Any other significant achievements you'd want to highlight under the Ministry of Labor and National Security? Well, there's so many. Uh, let me let me start with I uh, choose two. Oh, yeah, at least. Let, let me <laughs> let me start with labor. Yes. Um through the National Labor Board, we have been able to uh, revisit many of our labor-related laws. Okay. The National Labor Board took on the, the mantle in revisiting and revising the Antigua and Barbuda Labor Code. Mm -hmm. It took a long time. A lot of work went into it. But they have now completed the task of revising the Labor Code, and that revised law is now waiting to be passed in Parliament. Hmm. A tremendous undertaking, and that will go a long way hmm. in terms of labor relation matters in this country. They've also looked at and revised um, health and safety laws in this country. Uh, prior to the work of the National Labor Board, the health and safety um, regulations would have been part of the Labor Code. But we are now proposing to take it out of the Labor Code and have it as a standalone bit of legislation. The National Labor Board has completed its work mm -hmm. in respect of the health and safety, the new health and safety um, regulations uh, for this country. And also, that vexing area of workmen's compensation. The law goes back, I think, to the 1950s. The National Labor Board is presently just completing its revision in respect of that critical area. So there is a slew of labor-related legislation mm -hmm. that would have been revised under the National Labor Board and which should pass in the Parliament of Antigua and Barbuda uh, pretty soon. They've also revamped our approach to conciliation. 
as you may know, where persons may have any issue in respect of unfair dismissal or mm -hmm. any challenge at the workplace, the first step is the Labor Department. If they wish, they could bring that matter to the Labor Department for hearing. There have been complaints in terms of the process and the inefficiency of the process and so on. We have listened to all of our stakeholders and we have recently announced new and wide sweeping measures that would seek to really improve the service delivery in terms of our conciliation process. Firstly, mm -hmm. we have hired a number of additional conciliators. Secondly, we have brought on three eminent individuals to mediate and to assist in the process. Okay. Thirdly, we have said as a policy, anyone who files a complaint with the Labor Department will be granted a hearing in at least no more than six weeks of filing that claim. Okay. So you don't have to file a claim and wait for months and months and months. In addition to that, there's also been a complaint when matters are heard, um, you have to wait an excessive length of time to get a report. We have now said that that report will be generated in no more than 30 days. So a number of issues have taken place that would go a long way in easing and improving the conciliation process. So it therefore means that from a labor relations standpoint, the people who seek to utilize the Labor Department will benefit significantly from that particular improvement. I'm sure you must also have heard of the, um, the Minimum Wage Advisory Committee. Yes. That is a committee which has its root in the Labor Code, mm -hmm. and it allows the minister to appoint a, a committee to advise the minister, and by extension the government, in respect of the minimum wage or wages in this country. Mm. I utilize the provision in the Labor Code to appoint the Minimum Wage Advisory Committee May of 2013. Mm -hmm. And that committee worked for many months and recently submitted its final report to me for consideration. The report was submitted in March of 2014 mm -hmm. and the report I took to cabinet for its consideration. And I'm sure the nation of Antigua and Barbuda will perhaps sooner rather than later hear the pronouncement of cabinet in respect of the recommendations from this very important committee vis-a-vis -vis the national minimum wage. So those are some areas that you know I think are very critical areas yeah. uh, in respect of the labor relation matters in this country. But let me say, if I had to point to one thing, I would say that we have been able to maintain a very stable industrial relations climate in this country. And I want to thank all the unions yes. for the tremendous cooperation and the employers also. This tripartite group of unions representing workers, the employers and government have worked closely mm -hmm. to ensuring that we have a stable environment. Can you imagine? Hmm. We would have gone through the biggest recession known to us here in Antigua and Barbuda. Persons would have been laid off. Persons would have been placed on um, short weeks. Yeah. But notwithstanding all of that, we have been able to maintain a stable environment in terms of industrial relations. Hats off to the unions and the employers for being very responsible in this regard. How would you late, uh, rate the performance of our government with regards to labor relations and employment? Well, you know, um, that question is a little self-serving because if rated the government, I'd be rating myself. Yes. And I really wouldn't want to I really really wouldn't want to rate myself. I would leave yes. that for someone else. Mm -hmm. Only to say that we have worked hard to maintain a stable environment mm -hmm. and as a government to do our best to create job opportunities for for all. Let me give you an example. We have recently started a new work experience program in the Ministry of Labor. Mm -hmm. That started last year, October. Different to all other work experience programs that we would have run 
to the Ministry of Labor. Mm -hmm. This program is a program that allows individuals, primarily youngsters who are unemployed, to come on board and we find work for them with various businesses. Mm -hmm. And we guarantee them a, a weekly um, pay, which is above minimum wage, mm -hmm. for at least six months, with the possibility of that being renewed for a further six months. And then with the intention of the respective employers offering permanent employment to these individuals. During the period, though, we bring them back into the classroom and we give them life skills and so forth and so forth. And that program is working marvelously. I am very, very happy. So what we have done is to create employment opportunities for many young people who would not otherwise have been engaged mm -hmm. in employment. We're speaking about the 10 years of the United Progressive Party. Mm -hmm. Well, let me step back and look at the first five years. And I am pleased to tell you that no time in the history of this country, this Antigua and Barbuda has seen growth as high as in 2006. The economy of Antigua and Barbuda grew by over 13% in 2006. I say that to say the job creation that would have taken place under the United Progressive Party government from 2004 right up to when the Great Recession hit at the end of 2008 was just phenomenal. Nowhere else you had that level of growth anywhere in the Caribbean, nowhere else. And we have never experienced that level of growth. And had it not been for the recession uh, or the great, the great Recession, let me use the word great, of mm -hmm. 2008, the economy would have continued to grow as it was previously. However, we were able to stabilize. We were able to hold on. Not one public servant was laid off, mm -hmm. notwithstanding the tremendous challenges in terms of being able to pay wages and salaries to public servants. Not one was yes. sent home. Yes. And things have now turned around where we are now experiencing positive growth. Mm -hmm. So we are well on the way to achieving full employment once again. And that is what I have to say in respect of job creation. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about national security um, and the safety of our shores and safety of the people of uh, Antigua and Barbuda. Sure. Uh, in my view, this whole issue of national security mm -hmm. is of paramount importance to the government of Antigua and Barbuda. Yeah. Your safety and the safety of all citizens and residents and visitors to this country is of paramount importance. Mm -hmm. Hence, we have introduced a number of measures to ensure that the people who live and work in this country mm -hmm. are safe. Let me start with some of the more recent initiatives. Yes. You would recall that we announced this initiative of the CCTV camera project. Mm -hmm. That has started. That project is going to go a long way in helping our law enforcement officers to have a better handle on crime. Sure. We don't have the resources to put police officers on every single street corner. Mm -hmm. But with these cameras, we will be able to see much more than any police officer would be able to see standing at the street corner. Mm -hmm. That CCTV project is going to revolutionize how we deal with crime and criminals. And I am very, very proud of that. To that, I would add that the government spent substantial monies investing in the 911 emergency system. Before that system came on board, you may recall, if you have an, an emergency, whether it's a criminal trying to break into your house or some sort of health issue, well, let's, say, let's take the crime. Someone is trying to break into your house. Mm -hmm. You would jump on the phone, and if you're in St. John's, you call the St. John's police station. If you're living out in the country, you try to call the nearest uh, police station to where you are living. The 911 system, though, 
allows you to pick up your phone and dial 911 for help. And there is a dispatcher working or dispatchers working 24-7. They receive your call and they're able to direct your call to the police and get whoever is the nearest police to you in a matter of seconds. That's why when people call 911, the response is so rapid mm -hmm. because the operator is able to call, okay, we have a call coming from Crosby's. Uh, the nearest patrol in Crosby's, could you respond immediately? Mm -hmm. That nearest patrol is there at your door in a matter of seconds. And I am very proud of that particular system. It has helped, it worked, and it works well. I am pleased in respect of that. What other um, strategies and plans are in place when it comes to national security? Because again, tourism is our main industry. So we have persons coming in from the shore, we have them coming via air. Uh, what are some of the strategies that you have implemented and some laws to ensure that we manage the security of Antigua and Barbuda? As you would appreciate, any island state would have challenges in terms of protecting um, its borders. Yes. We have embarked on a process where we have been seeking to improve on our Coast Guard capacity. Yes. We were uh, fortunate to receive two new vessels under the CBSI program with the United States. Those vessels have gone a long way in helping us to better patrol and protect our coasts and coastal areas. Okay. I am very concerned in respect of the proliferation of illegal firearms in this country yeah. because the violent crimes that are being committed here are crimes that are firearm related, illegal firearms. So we need to better patrol our borders. We need to not only use our Coast Guard, but also invest in scanners that would scan the barrels and the containers to look for guns in particular, mm -hmm. to really keep guns at a minimum in respect of floating around in this country. So I am happy in terms of what we've done with the Coast Guard so far. In addition to that, we recently went on a visit to Brazil okay. and signed a framework agreement with the government of Brazil through the Defense Minister of Brazil where we will be working closely with Brazil in a number of areas to include training for our military personnel and more particular, an upgrading of our Coast Guard facilities, again, to allow us to better protect our shoreline and ensure that persons are not able to come in easily with mm -hmm. illegal guns and the like. Okay. Mr. Minister, I wanted us to talk a little bit about your constituency work because, again, this session of your right to know, our pleasure to tell. I know over the past 10 years you've done a whole lot, so I think it would be your pleasure to tell Antigua and Barbuda some of the work that you've done in your constituency thus far. Yes, I am very proud in respect of what would have transpired in St. John's Maurice yes. from 2004 under my stewardship. I think any fair-minded person would concede that tremendous work would have taken place in that constituency. Yes. I also believe that any fair-minded person would, would concede that even though I lost the seat in 2009, I continued to do yeah. my work and in fact acted as if I was the elected representative of the area. Mm -hmm. So for example, my two flagship projects continue, that is Project Hope, over mm -hmm. there on Hawkins Drive yes. and Hope Institute, just opposite the Clear Hall Secondary School. Yes. Those two projects have brought significant benefit to the people in the area. Yes. For example, if you take Project Hope, Project Hope started back in 2006, and between that time and now, over 3,600 individuals would have wow. gone through that center and would have benefited from the various programs. We have parenting programs, we have remedial reading, so persons who don't know how to read and write, they could come on a Saturday morning and they could you know, work with our folks to learn how to read. Mm -hmm. We do CXC, math, English, and IT. And when the nation is failing math, 
how are folks are passing by. <laughs> we have an nice. IT center there, and we have a nice library. Yes. We do a lot of programs from there. We have our summer camps, and mm -hmm. Miss Maria Hughes has been doing a wonderful job at uh, the Project Hope Center over okay. there in Hawkins Drive. At the Hope Institute, we have Mrs. Donna Francis. Mm -hmm. She, too, has done a wonderful job in terms of the older uh, kids who come there from the Clear Horse Secondary, from yes. the Grammar School, from the T.N. Kernan School. Yes. It provides a safe haven for kids when they finish school. Instead of lying in the streets, they can come there, they can go to the library, they can use the computer facilities, they can use the games room. It also serves as a community center for many. Persons yes. who wish to hold functions and have meetings, they come there at no cost, they use the facility. But I'm very pleased that from 2009, when Hope Institute was open to today, we have served over 12,000 hot meals wow. to the people, the needy people in the community. That is a major, major thing. I'm very pleased. But, but very let's pleased. expand a little bit about that in the sense of the hot meals, because these are meals that are being delivered that's to these individuals who are that's unable correct. to leave their home. Absolutely. And that's something very specific to we highlight. We have a little van and we bring yes. the meals to these individuals who are unable to leave home. They're bedridden yes. or otherwise down with some sort of illness. And we provide them with meals weekly over 12,000 hot meals. And just recently, we held um, a health fair there. Mm -hmm. I yes. was very, very pleased that we were able, uh, Hope Institute, to partner with mm -hmm. Women of Esteem yes. and host that uh, health fair. What a successful health fair. Mm -hmm. And lots of people came, not only from the neighborhood, but from all over the country. Yeah. And more importantly, the doctors and the nurses and all the volunteers who came and gave freely of their service, yes. the response was outstanding. And that center continues to provide significant benefit, not only to the rural East community, but to the country at large. Uh, Mr. Minister, what has been the feedback from the individuals around in your constituency? I mean, those who have benefit and those who do not even, or maybe there are some who are not aware of some of these services that you have extended. Do you think that is even possible? That you No, know, <laughs> I did not think yes. it is possible. <laughs> but in campaigning, and I'm saying this to folks, you say, but I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't see? realize that. I said, but how, how would you not know? Yes. The scent is just down the road from you. Oh, I was not aware. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I know, well, you know, my, my children went there, but I didn't know that you were doing so many other things. Yes. Or some may know of uh, Hope Institute, but not aware of Project Hope, or mm -hmm. may think it's the same thing, yes. and so on. So you still have folks who are not aware. But by and large, a lot of people would know because, as I said, over 3,600 persons would have gone through the doors yes. of uh, Project Hope. Mm -hmm. And likewise, Hope Institute, thousands of persons. Yes. So, you know, we just keep up the work. And as I said, I function as if I am the representative <laughs> and I just, you know, do what I have to do. So you're in the campaign for 2014 elections. Uh, what are your expectations for this election season? I think um, the elections are going to be very interesting elections. Mm -hmm. These elections will signal a turning point in the politics of this country, yes. depending on who win and who lose. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, if the United Progressive Party wins, and I feel confident that we will win, yes. you will see a totally different face in the opposition. A number of the Labour Party uh, candidates will fall out because of age and otherwise, mm -hmm. so that the Labour Party will have to restructure and rebuild. Uh, likewise, if the United Progressive Party does not win, I believe you'll see a whole reform and restructured uh, yes. UPP. Uh, my feeling, though, is that the United Progressive Party would have done more than enough mm -hmm. to deserve a third term. And I believe if the electorate is fair, the United Progressive Party will win overwhelmingly yes. the 2014 elections. The record is there. And as they say, check your facts. <laughs> yes. Don't just listen to persons rant and rave and talk foolishness. Check your you facts. You go and check your facts. Yes. And if you check your facts, I am confident that you would be satisfied 
that this is a government that deserves a third term. You have men and women being part of this organization who are honest, forthright, upright people. People who have the capacity to perform, people who have the capacity to move Antigua and Barbuda forward. Yes. You go anywhere internationally today hmm. and you speak to colleagues from wherever and they will tell you the representation of Antigua and Barbuda regionally, sub-regionally and internationally is of the highest level. Yeah. And I think that our citizens should be proud yeah. to have the United Progressive Party governing this country. And I hope that they will see it the way I see it mm -hmm. and agree to give the UPP a third term of governance in this country. Uh, we're still talking a little bit about elections. Um, and as the Minister of National Security, in this period from since January has started, there have been a lot of instigation of um, criminal acts of, of aggression, of, of attempting to cause confusion over the nation. As the Minister of Finance, sorry, as the Minister of National Security, sorry, have you been meeting with your team and putting certain strategic plans in place should anything occur or, or in the event of? Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, you know, in, in a sensitive ministry is national security. Mm -hmm. You have to plan, you have to put um, things in place in the event of. Mm -hmm. but. These are issues that would remain uh, quiet. We would not, um, you know, speak publicly yes. uh, to them. But obviously, you have to be responsible. You yes. have to anticipate this may happen or that may happen. You can't wait for something to happen and then scramble to try to do things. Yeah. Um, but having said that, I use the occasion to say to all my brothers and sisters, citizens and residents, that we all have a democratic right to exercise our choice as to who we would wish to govern. Yes. And we need to do that in a very decent and calm way. There is no need for acrimony and fighting and lawlessness. Yes. You may not like my policy. That's okay. You could tell me that. We could have a discussion. Mm -hmm. But there is no need for there to be a fist fight or any lo or lawless behavior, mm -hmm. let us conduct ourselves in a responsible manner. And if we do that, I am satisfied elections will come and go. There will be winners, there will be losers, <laughs> yes. but there will be no violence. I really like that answer. Um, Mr. Minister, let's talk a little bit more about labor um, with regards to employment and the advancement of employment. Um, tie in a little bit with that, with the youth empowerment and young entrepreneurs. How have you been seeing the advancement with regards to that? Yeah. I mentioned uh, early on in the interview the new uh, work experience program mm -hmm. yes. that we would have embarked upon, and that has done wonders. We have employed in excess of 300 uh, young persons. Yes. And we are in the process of increasing that to 500. Yeah. And the skills that these young folks would have attained over this short six month period are remarkable. Mm -hmm. Now, in addition to that, the government has a number of other programs. So you have the LEAP program, coming out to the Ministry of Finance and young people are able to be placed in different parts of government and get the experience. We were a beneficiary of that particular uh, program in the Ministry of National Security and Labor where we had certain folks over the summer come in to work with us and based on the feedback I got, they were outstanding. Mm -hmm. They too enjoyed the experience, the exposure. So that program has worked well. We have, with Dr. Mansour, a number of programs. The GATE program, yes. he's just announced the HEART program. Yes. And all of these programs are targeting young people in this country yeah. and equipping them with a skill. You know what I like? I like the notion of not, saying, uh, of not simply saying, okay, you just create a job and you give a youngster. Mm. I like the notion of equipping them with the skills, yes. bringing them into the gate center, 
teaching them photography and whatever else, yes. equipping them with the skills so then they can go out and market themselves, mm -hmm. either as self-employed individuals or employees in some sort of business. That has worked well. You have the each program. Again, another program targeting young persons from an apprenticeship standpoint. Yes. That too has brought a lot of assistance to young people in this country. So I am very pleased in terms of all the various programs vis-a-vis -vis job creation in this country that the government has embarked upon. I would say this though. Mm -hmm. In my view, the government is not the employer of first resort. However, where you have challenging economic times, difficult economic times where unemployment is rising, the government has an obligation to assist however it can. And therefore, the government has been assisting through these various programs. At the end of the day, though, ultimately, it is for the private sector to expand so that the private sector could absorb all of these um, levels of employment. And I am seeing the types of growth coming back and the private sector beginning to get vibrant and buoyant once again. And I therefore foresee that a lot of these uh, youngsters will sooner rather than later get gainful employment in the private sector as mm -hmm. we grow the economy. So the key issue here is to grow the economy of Antigua and Barbuda, and we have started. I look forward to the Beaches Program yes. project beginning in 2014. I look forward to all of those other projects that the Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister would have announced, mm -hmm. um, starting between 2014 and 2015. I'm beginning to be very concerned whether we're going to have the manpower or woman power, as the case may be, to fill all yes. of these jobs that will become available. Yes. The economy of Antigua and Barbuda will once again begin to boom mm -hmm. as it did in 2006 and 7. Yes. Let's talk a little bit more about immigration and the passport sure. office. What are some of the policies that you, as the Minister of National Security, has implemented to alleviate the strain from migrant women, migrant families, and those who are seeking citizenship here in Antigua and Barbuda? I would say to you that the Immigration and Passport Bill, which was just recently passed, in mm -hmm. both Houses of Parliament in Antigua yes. Barbuda must be the single most important bit of legislation that would have been piloted by okay. the Ministry of National Security and Labor. Okay. That bit of legislation is going to radically change how things would have operated in respect of immigrants to this country. Mm -hmm. Far-reaching changes. In fact, we all believe that that act is going to be used as the prototype for immigration throughout the region. It has regularized a number of areas. For example, those persons who would have been on temporary residence and who would have had challenges with their temporary residence and mm. illegal temporary residence and so on, yes. we are repealing all of that and we're creating a category of a residence certificate. So once you've been lawfully residing in Antigua and Barbuda mm -hmm. for at least four years, you will qualify to apply for a residence card. Okay. And that residence card will be valid for three years and it will allow you to work. Yes. So that is going to really transform what currently obtains because what currently obtains is the persons on temporary residence have to come in every year yes. and have to pay their fee and go through the whole process and that has been a challenge for many. We've also introduced procedures mm -hmm. in respect of children who are not citizens coming and going into the schools, whether public or private schools, where you're now going to require a student permit, as is the case in most countries, okay. where you need a student permit to go to school, whether you're going to primary school, secondary school, or you're going to some sort of ter tertiary um, institution. So again, that is a new phenomenon. We have also put into that act provisions 
that would recognize the recent CCJ uh, judgment in the Myrie case and also recognize our obligations under the revised Treaty of Bastyr mm -hmm. vis-a-vis the OECS and the revised Treaty of Chagaramas vis-a-vis CARICOM. Mm -hmm. So in other words, CARICOM nationals will be able to come to this country and be given six months stay in the country. Okay. There are obviously limitations in respect of that particular situation and those are spelled out. Also, in respect to OECS nationals, we, along with the other OECS countries, would have signed off on the OECS economic um, agreement. Mm -hmm. And under that agreement, we have committed ourselves to free movement of OECS citizens without any restrictions. This act is giving legal effect to that particular agreement that would have been signed off on. And I'm told that Antigua and Barbuda was perhaps the only OECS country that had not yet implemented those provisions. Okay. So we'd have gone a long way. And in terms of due process, as it is now, before the passage of this um, act, you have a problem, you go to the chief immigration officer. Mm -hmm. If you're not satisfied with that, well, huh, tough luck. <laughs> Under yes. this um, new legislation, we are creating an Immigration Appeals Tribunal. Okay. So your rights are protected. You can appeal to the tribunal. And if you're not happy with that, you can go to the High Court and the Court of Appeal. So it is a modern approach to how you deal with these issues and to ensure that whatever we do, there is due process. I like the previous statement that you mentioned for individuals who are not satisfied because since we're talking about immigration again, there are so many migrants. Do we call them migrants or immigrants? Well, uh, <laughs> it depends on who you speak to. Yeah, so we have so many persons coming into Antigua and Barbuda and many have said, you know, the challenge of, of gaining their passport or their citizenship and if should one thing be out of place, um, they're totally denied. How has your ministry been putting certain policies and stipulations in place to alleviate um, those complaints? Yeah, that has been a big challenge. Yes. And it has been a big challenge because you have qualifications for citizenship under the Constitution of Antigua and Barbuda. Okay. And you have qualifications for citizenship under the Antigua and Barbuda Citizenship Act. Okay. Most persons who are applying who are from the CARICOM region apply under the Constitution, in particular, Section 1141C2 of the Constitution mm -hmm. of Antigua and Barbuda. That section says that for you to be eligible for citizenship via residence, you must have been lawfully residing mm -hmm. in the country for at least seven years immediately before making the application for citizenship. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? lawfully residing for seven consecutive years immediately before making the application. It means, and the office has been advised, that if there is any break in that seven-year period, you do not qualify because you break your seven-year residence, yes. lawful residence. Mm -hmm. Some people do not appreciate that you could be living in the country but not lawful for seven consecutive years. So some people come and say, but I didn't go anywhere, I've been here all the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, you've been here all the time, but did you go into the immigration department and ensure that your yes. stay was up to date at all times? Mm -hmm. Oh no, well, you know, I had a little you know, gap here or gap there. Mm -hmm. That would serve to issue. disqualify you. Yeah. I also wish to clarify this point because when we talk about gaps and talk about that issue, some people erroneously conclude that you have to be here for seven years so you can't even take a little one-week vacation and go back home or go somewhere. Well, that is not so. I'll give you an example. Let us say you are here on a work permit. Mm -hmm. And let's say your work permit is valid from January to December. Yeah. And you get that stamp in your passport January to December from the Immigration Department. Now, if you wish to go on a vacation to Guyana or to Jamaica or to New York, mm -hmm. um, let us say you want to go in October. You can go and you can spend a month if you wish. That's not a problem. A month and a half, whatever mm -hmm. you want. Mm -hmm. As long as you get back here 
before December 31st and get your thing renewed. Yes. If you stay out of the country and beyond the time stamped in your passport, then you create a gap. True. So this gap does not mean that you can't travel. You can, but you have to make sure that your status is up to date at all times. So that has created a little challenge for some. We've been trying to work with them. We've been trying to okay. deal with the situation. The okay. matter has been looked at at cabinet. Uh, there's a cabinet decision of the 16th of July, 2013, looking at that and saying, okay, maybe in cases where there might have been some very small gap of a few days or weeks, as the case may be, mm -hmm. or in situations where persons would have come to this country as youngsters, gone to school, didn't keep their time updated, no yeah. fault of theirs, it might have been their parents' fault, how do you blame the children? Then we have to find a way to understand that and to facilitate the process. So the cabinet has been looking at various ways to assist persons who may find themselves in that difficult position. But this is really a challenge, I have to tell you, you know. Um, <laughs> yes. My phone rings constantly yes. in respect of this issue. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you, you know, I, I smile, you know, people, our opponents get up and they say, oh, things are so hard in this country and la, 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 and whatever else. <laughs> but the amount of um, Karakan brothers and sisters that who come here, come here yes. and continue to come here yes. and who want to live here. Mm -hmm. I say, well, that is not corresponding mm -hmm. with the reality on the ground. Every month, the citizenship office receive applications from no less than about a hundred persons wow. per month. Every month. Every month. Wow. So they are under stress and challenge, but we try to cope. Wow. Uh, Mr. Minister, I want to thank you so much for coming. Is there any last word or statement that you'd like to advise our viewing and listening audience before we wrap up this session of your right to know, our pleasure to tell? The only thing I would wish to say is we are going into general elections in this country. And I urge all voters to think, think wisely. Mm -hmm. Do not act rashly or irrationally. Look at the facts. Look at what both parties say they are able to do. More importantly, look at what the United Progressive Party has done mm -hmm. over the last 10 years. Refresh your memory in respect of the Antigua Labour Party and its stewardship of this country. And when you're refreshing your memory, I want you to remember the fiscal irresponsible nature mm -hmm. under which the Antigua Labour Party governed this country. And I say to you, if you want this country to go back to those dark days, then you will put back the Antigua Labour Party. If you want this country to continue to progress and build on what we would have put over the last 10 years, then you will re-elect the United Progressive Party. Think wisely. Thank you. Mr. Minister, I want to thank you for taking some time today and to have a sit down with me on your right to know, our pleasure to tell. Thank you very much for having me. It certainly was a pleasure being here. To our viewing and listening audience at home, you've been in tune to Your Right to Know, Our Pleasure to Tell. And speaking with us today was the Minister of National Security and Labor, the Honorable Dr. Errol Court. Tune in again to another session of Your Right to Know, Our Pleasure to Tell. I am Malaika Muffet.